All right, can everyone see the, um, just give me a thumbs up or something if you can see the, great. All right, hello everyone and welcome to the Research Society for American Periodicals Book Prize Roundtable. This panel celebrates the winner and honorable mentions of the 2020 Book Prize. The RSAP offers this prize biennially and uh, so pu books published in 2019 and 2020 were eligible. The Book Prize Judges panel was made up of myself, I'm Ben Fagan, as well as Kirsten McLeod and Tim Lanzendorfer. And I would like to thank Kirsten and Tim for all of their work on this committee. We received uh, 24 entries, which I believe, although I'm not certain of this, but I'm, I believe is the highest number uh, that we've ever had submitted for this prize. And out of those uh, entries, um, which were consistently excellent, we selected one winner and four honorable mentions. And the purpose of this roundtable is to celebrate the authors of these books, to showcase their excellent work, and to have a discussion about the current state of periodical studies more broadly. What I'm going to do is introduce each panelist um, all together, ask them to address an opening question I've prepared, and then we can move into discussion. And I'm going to go uh, in the order in which they are on our program, if you see that on our registration page. That's, that's the order I'm going in. So Victoria Bazin is senior lecturer in, and I apologize if I mispronounce people's names. Um, I've never met some of you face to face before. So um, Victoria Bazin is senior lecturer in American literature at Northumbria University, Newcastle upon Tyne in the UK. She is the author of Marianne Moore and the Cultures of Modernity and Modernism Edited, Marianne Moore and the Dial Magazine, which I'll say more about in a moment. She co-edited with Melanie Waters, a special issue of Women, a Cultural Review on Periodical Culture from Suffrage to the Second Wave, and has more recently contributed a chapter to Women's Periodicals and Print Culture in Britain, 1940s to 2000s. Victoria Bazin's book, Modernism Edited, Marianne Moore and the Dial Magazine is the winner of the 2020 RSAP Book Prize. The Book Prize judges declare Bazin's book, quote, a flawless study of all that it means to be the editor of a key modernist periodical with an impact that goes well beyond Moore and the Dial. The book, they continue, quote, provides just the right balance between bigger picture issues and detailed analysis and is dexterous in its mobilization of methodological and theoretical approaches to illuminate its subject matter. Jean Lee Cole is professor of English at Loyola University, Maryland. She is the author of The Literary Voices of Winifred Eaton, Redefining Ethnicity and Authenticity and How the Other Half Laughs, The Comic Sensibility in American Literature, 1895 to 1920 as well as numerous journal articles, excuse me, and the editor or co-editor of four scholarly editions. She is also um, a former editor of the journal American Periodicals and a past president of the Research Society for American Periodicals. Jean Lee Cole's book, How the Other Half Laughs, The Comic Sensibility in American Literature, 1895 to 1920 is an honorable mention for the 2020 RSAP Book Prize. Her work, according to the prize judges, is, quote, a crucial expansion of how we look at, at the humor in cartooning at the genesis of newspaper comic strips that challenges us to understand its ethnic and class dimensions more fully. Sam Graber is Associate Professor of Humanities and Literature in Christ College, the Honors College of Valparaiso University, where he teaches a variety of interdisciplinary courses on visual culture, social thought, and American literature and culture. He's published essays in journals and collections such as ESQ, the Walt Whitman Quarterly Review, Literary Cultures of the American Civil War, Visions of Glory, and the Cambridge Companion to the Literature of the American Civil War and Reconstruction. Sam Graber's first book, Twice Divided Nation, National Memory, Transatlantic News, and American Literature in the Civil War Era is an honorable mention for the 2020 RSAP Book Prize. This book, again, in the words of the Book Prize judges, you're going to hear their collective voices a few times, is, quote, a masterful study that works across disciplines and in a transatlantic context to tease out a compelling narrative about the role of the American and British press in, shape, in the shaping of American national memory in the 19th century. E. James West is a UK-based historian. There we go. 
His research focuses on the Black press in the United States and the Black Atlantic. His next book, and I'll say more about his first in a moment, but his next book, A House for the Struggle, The Black Press and the Built Environment in Chicago, as someone from Chicago, I'm excited about this book, will be published by the University of Illinois Press in early 2022. He is currently completing two monographs, a bi biography of Lerone Bennett Jr., which will be published by the University of Massachusetts Press in summer 2022, and a survey history of the Black press in the United States, which will be published by Edinburgh University Press in 2024. E. James West's Ebony Magazine and Lerone Bennett Jr., Popular Black History in Post-War America is an honorable mention for the 2020 RSAB Book Prize. The Book Prize judges describe this book as, quote, a remarkable study of a small but vital slice of African-American periodical history and history in periodicals that makes an important contribution, not only to studies of African-American periodicals and print culture, but encourages us to think about the role magazines might play as venues for popular history. Paul Williams is Associate Professor of 20th Century Literature and Culture at the University of Exeter in the UK. In addition to chapters and articles published in journals such as American Quarterly, the Journal of American Studies, Science Fiction Studies, Studies in the Novel and Textual Practice, he has written three books. Dreaming the Graphic Novel, the novelization of comics, which I'll talk about in a second, Paul Gilroy, and Race, Ethnicity, and Nuclear War. His new book, The U.S. Graphic Novel, is forthcoming from Edinburgh University Press. Paul Williams' book, Dream the Graphic Novel, the Novelization of Comics is an honorable mention for the 2020 RSAP Book Prize. This book, in the words of the Book Prize judges, is, quote, a richly detailed examination of the complex history of the comic book's trials and tribulations as a periodical form and the eventual rise of the graphic novel that promises to be a touchstone for future comic scholarship and especially the integration of comics and periodicals works. So that is my introduction, and I'm going to stop screen sharing and go ahead and, um, and say that my hope is that the bulk of this session is taken up by a discussion between and among the panelists and the audience. Um, please feel free to put questions in the chat at any time, and we'll do our best to put them together and, and relay them to the panelists. And once we've finished with some opening remarks from each panelist, Please do feel free to ask questions by virtually raising your hand or go like this. We'll see if we can see you. Um, before we start the discussion, I have asked each panelist to speak for just a few minutes about the genesis of their project and what they see as its relationship um, to periodical studies. We can just go in the order of the program, the order in which I just introduced people, and I'll <laughs> remind you of that if we forget about it as we, as we go. Um, but first, uh, let's start with Victoria Bazin. So Victoria, if you just wanna take it away and talk a little bit about the genesis of your book and what you see as the relationship uh, that it has to periodical studies. Thanks, thank you so much, Ben. Can you hear me okay? Great, okay. Thank you, and thank you to the RSAP and to those who took the time Kirsten and Tim and Ben yourself, who took the time and trouble to read all these books, 24 is a lot of books to read, um, but this, that's a real labor of love. Um, and it points to the generosity and the collegiality of this community of scholars. And I have to say, it's just made a huge difference to me personally. So thanks very, very much. In this, um, I'm just gonna give a kind of short overview of, as you say, the genesis of this book. And I'm gonna start with the title of the book, which is obviously Modernism Edited, Marianne Moore and the Dial Magazine. And when I first pitched this book um, to EUP, it was just Marianne Moore and the Dial Magazine. So that, that was a, a basic sort of recovery project. It was um, a, a story about Marianne Moore. I was a scholar who'd worked on Moore's poetry for many years. I was aware that she'd edited the Dial magazine from 1925 to 1929, but surprisingly, no one had ventured into the extensive archives to explore her editorial role at the magazine. Um, so there was a kind of eerie silence surrounding more at the Dial. More scholars um, and those interested in modernist magazines, I got the impression were sort of politely tiptoeing around more. Um, even though the dial itself, um, as people like Lawrence Rainey had pointed out, was one of the magazines, the key magazines that was responsible for the institutionalization of modernism. And Rainey's kind of forensic um, uh, 
account of the publication of Eliot's The Wasteland in the Dial in 1922, you know, it was, that was one of the publications that kick-started the rise of modern periodical studies, the little magazines, etc. So while the Dial of the early 20s, around 1922, has received lots of critical attention, the Dial associated with Moore's tenure has been more or less ignored. So why would this be? The first reason is good old fashioned sexism, even though women have played an enormously significant role in what Aaron Jeff has described as that kind of downstream work of publishing, promoting and administering modernism. Many women editors were up until relatively recently either ignored or dismissed. Um, Jane Marrick's book, I think probably many of you might, might know about this, is it was published in 1995, but it highlighted the work of uh, Moore herself, but also people like Margaret Anderson at the Little Review and Harriet, um, Harriet Munro at Poetry Magazine. But even as scholarship on the so-called, and that's a problematic term, little magazines exploded, Moore as an editor was largely overlooked. So that's one reason, that kind of old fashioned sec uh, uh, sexism. The second reason, um, for that neglect, I think, is that I'm sure scholars, particularly more scholars, were actually reluctant to confront what many perceive to be Moore's editorial transgressions. There's a very famous case, um, which is Moore's revision, and I'm putting that in inverted commas, her revision of the poem by Hart Crane called The Wine Menagerie, where she reduces 45 lines to 18 lines. Um, and she uh, retitles the poem again. And that caused a great deal of consternation, as you can imagine. Crane himself com um, complained about Moore. He called her an hysterical virgin in uh, letters to his friends. And that moment really has been the moment when, you know, Moore has been characterized as being kind of overly fastidious, prudish, um, basically kind of preoccupied with um, gentility. Um, and, and she's been characterized as, a, as an editor who more or less tamed the dial as a magazine and um, it lost its sort of continental flavor under her um, editorship. So, so there, those were, I think, the two reasons why um, more was neglected. And also I kind of felt that um, uh, it was important to really recover her, her influence and her contribution to modernism. So I initially, conceived the project, as I say, straightforward recovery project. But then when I ventured further away from the discipline of literature and into the field of periodical studies, I began to see that editorial agency was much more complex and it was bound up with the magazine's discursive signature, its place in the market, its style, as well as its content. So the cultural authority of Miss Moore um, accrued um, and was related in a sense to the dial itself and its image of distinction. Uh, so it was much more complicated than I at first um, imagined, um, but much more interesting as a result. So to be specific, um, immersing myself in scholarship in periodical studies complicated my understanding of editorial agency in, in very useful ways. Um, I borrowed from a number of really excellent scholars um, mainly from Matthew Philpotts, who works on conceptualizing editorial agency, which I found really fascinating and useful. So just to give you an example of the effect of this on, on my understanding of Moore, that famous incident when she cuts Hart Crane's poem, when she drastically reduces it to eight, 18 lines from 45 lines, um, you know, one of the things that I looked at was what she did to that poem, and what she did to that poem was very similar to what she did to her own poetry. She essentially cut off the head of the poem, she cut off the first two stanzas, and she condensed. Um, she loved um, contraction, uh, to, to quote Marianne Moore herself, contra contractility is a virtue, and particularly for an editor, that's a, that's a kind of handy thing um, to, uh, to be good at. So, that sort of explains how she approached that poem. But in order to understand the motives behind the cuts, one has to look at the dial itself and one has to understand its place in the marketplace. 
one has to understand that it was striving to be a quality magazine. And Moore felt that her readers would not um, approve of a poem that was about a kind of seedy sexual encounter in a bar, basically. Uh, so she took that bit out and she condensed the poem and she just um, basically kind of left what she thought was the essence of the poem. Now, you might not agree with that decision, but it explains it explains the, the motives underpinning uh, Moore's editorial practice. So to return to the title of this book, The Insertion of Modernism Edited Before Marianne Moore and the Dial Magazine, that signals, that title signals the recognition that there were many agents involved in the production of the magazine and by extension, the social production of modernism, a fact that Moore herself repeatedly pointed out. There weren't just authorial agents, there were editorial agents. In some instances, that the instances there were non-human agents involved in the production of the magazine. So I, I think, um, and just, just final thoughts here, I think the brilliance of Moore's um, editorship emerges actually out of an understanding of the distinct affordances of the magazine, as well as her own poetic practice. And it's about kind of combining those two things, close textual analysis of Moore's methods, her editorial approach, together with an understanding of the affordances of the magazine. And I think that reveals the extent to which she occupied, you know, a position of extraordinary power and authority in the late 1920s. Thank you so much, Victoria. Um, Jean Lee Cole, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, yeah, thanks. It's it's really uh, great to. I'm assuming you can hear me. <laughs> Is that right? Okay. Um, it's really great to be um, addressing you in this context. Um, you know, I, I think I've always been kind of on the other side. So. Um, yeah, so the genesis of this book, um, I, this is going to be very informal, I, because, you know, it was kind of a process of uh, micro archaeology, I want to say, and I got really kind of self indulgent in revisiting the history of this book, so I hope you'll bear with me. Um, but this, um, hopefully, it, it will be instructive, actually, for people who are working on um, their own books about how these projects sometimes happen. Um, so this book actually was 12 years in the making. Um, and then what emerged was a quite slim volume, and I was shocked when I heard I got this award. Um, but it actually started, it was this kind of gradual process of winnowing down. And um, so it began in 2008. Um, I'm also going to talk about titles. Um, but I was thinking, you know, in response to Ben's prompt about like, what's the, um, how does it relate to periodical studies? I said, well, it started out as a periodical studies project. And, um, and so when I looked back in my notes, um, I saw that the initial subtitle of the book was American Periodicals and National Visions, 1890 to 1910. And I had originally conceived of this, you know, post tenure second book project as really being about like how um, American periodicals um, shaped national identity, especially in response to the Spanish-American War, um, as, as well as um, through like the uh, autobiographies that were serialized in some popular magazines of people like Booker T. Washington and Jacob Rees, um, and then also looking at representations of Native peoples. Um, and then there was going to be, um, at the time, not even a single chapter on comics. But that's where it started. Um, and after uh, about a year of research, I was like, oh my God, I'm never going to finish this book because I had gotten tenure. And with that came this incredible dump truck of service responsibilities. Um, and I'm at a 3-3 a, a teaching institution. And um, so I, even though I like to believe I'm superwoman, um, I realized there was no way I was ever going to um, survive to finish this book. So I cut it down to a single chapter of the book, which was going to be about visual culture in um, the 1890 to 1910 period. And, um, and this, was also, this was gonna be mostly rooted in periodicals, but I also decided to add in um, photography, early film and comic strips. Um, these were things that I thought were um, really integral to periodical culture of the time as well as really integral to ideas about forming um, people's conceptions of uh, what Americans were. Um, 
so I did that for a while. And, um, and then by 2013, um, I again realized that I may not ever live to finish that book. Um, and so I have to credit a really crucial intervention on the part of my department chair who said, I want to see you get promoted to full professor and I don't see how that's gonna happen <laughs> with the project that you have. Um, it was kind of a harsh uh, lunchtime conversation, but it was really helpful to me because I said, well, okay, fine, Mr. Chair, um, then what book would you write? You know, he had been kind of helping me and, and looking at things. And, um, and he said, you know which part of your book has legs? And he just kind of pointed at the paper and he said, it's this chapter on comics. <laughs> That's the thing that is going to sell this book. And, and I said, really, a whole book on comics? I just don't really see how that's going to um, play out. And he said, well, why, why don't you just try it? And um, so I did. And, um, and then I realized that there was plenty um, for a book. Um, I actually ended up cutting some things in order to actually get the book out the door in 2018 when I did. So, um, so yeah, so that's the story of this book. Um, maybe that'll generate some conversation about how we come up with books uh, and work on them. Um, so periodicals are no longer in the title, um, but illustration and dialect fiction, which were part of the initial conception are still there. And the whole project is really still about periodicals and the way that what I call a comic sensibility infuses a lot of periodical culture and, um, isn't actually recognized as, as um, in a lot of the literary and cultural history of that period. Um, so yeah, I'd love to, if you have questions about the actual book, I'm happy to answer them in the Q and A, um, but thanks Ben and RSAP for, for providing this forum. Thanks, Jean. Um, Sam Graber, you ready to talk a little bit about the genesis of your book and its relationship to periodical yeah. studies? Thanks again. I just want to echo what everybody said. I feel really honored to be part of this group, part of the discussion, and I've actually really appreciated hearing a little bit already about the book Genesis, just because I do think that helps to reinforce, as Jean said, some of the travails that we all run into when we think about book projects, especially when we're teaching heavy loads at places like 3-3 institutions. It can be challenging, and it's nice to hear those stories. Uh, and I'm really excited to hear more about um, all of the projects that are uh, being represented here today. Uh, my own book uh, is a first book, and uh, it's also one that began as a dissertation project in the American Studies Department at the University of Iowa uh, under uh, a great teacher and scholar, John Rayburn, who primarily worked actually in 20th century literature and culture, which I don't even touch on uh, really, other than something about Trump in the prologue, I think, in this book. Uh, but Iowa also has uh, some great 19th century literary uh, faculty, and that's where I got interested in periodicals under the tutelage of Kathleen Dipley. Um, who is just a wonderful scholar and continues to be a great influence on just about everything I do. Um, and I also uh, met Ed Folsom, who taught me to love Walt Whitman in a way that I never had as an undergraduate uh, for all of the weird things that I was turned off by when I first read him. Uh, so it turns out he's really interesting for all the reasons that I thought he was abhorrent <laughs> before when I first read him. Uh, and I've come to love Whitman, and he's a major focus of this book project. Um, so for both of those reasons, uh, Kathleen and Ed and Whitman and periodicals, I ended up shifting to the 19th century pretty quickly. And because I was working on an American uh, studies dissertation, I also started to gravitate towards uh, the uh, question of national memory and the American Civil War, which I thought was just incredibly interesting. Uh, and I was particularly interested because I was looking at periodicals in the way in which transatlantic news uh, in particular, particular was impacting uh, public understandings of national memory and ultimately the kinds of questions that got involved and, and played out in the American Civil War. And I just thought that was a, an under-recognized area that I wanted to dig into more. So uh, the project ended up turning into this two volume monster dissertation um, that let me focus on gigantic questions for better or worse. This is what American studies sometimes does to people uh, with subfields that range from public sculpture and popular photography to church building and religion. Uh, and in my dissertation defense meeting, it was Kathleen who, uh, who served the role of savior, as she often does for many of us, by suggesting that perhaps I might take part of that, maybe just the first volume, and think about that as a book, as opposed to trying to figure out a way to winnow that giant project down uh, to a book size that would work as a manuscript pitch. Um, so I did that. It took me quite a while. Um, and, uh, but ultimately, that's what ended up leading to the book that I submitted uh, to uh, Ben and the committee for consideration. 
Um, the other big influence on the book as it was sort of playing out and going forward from dissertation to book uh, was this amazing group of scholars uh, known as the Civil War Caucus uh, that meets annually under uh, uh, Professor Diffley's uh, organizational uh, skills at the Midwest Modern uh, Language Association, but involves a lot of scholars who work outside of the Midwest. Uh, and the fact that a lot of those folks actually are working on newspapers and magazines meant that periodicals would sort of remain a strong point of focus in the work that I've done since I, I got out of grad school. Um, so the book Twice Divided Nation grounds itself in periodical culture at a point when I think it was starting to kind of converge uh, as part of a nascent mass media. Uh, and so emphasizing the importance of that development and a lot of unrecognizable areas uh, is one of the book's main goals and it tries to do that in a couple of different ways. So one of the ways, for instance, is that I try to pay attention to the importance of Horace Greeley as well as Ralph Waldo Emerson as influences and allies in Walt Whitman's development as a poet. Uh, and again, I think Greeley is sort of an, unrecognizable, uh, an unrecognized uh, influence in a lot of ways, even though he's one of the first persons people to give uh, Whitman a forum uh, in a, a major periodical that you know, allowed him to reach a larger audience. Um, uh, pretty early in his career, actually, in a lot of ways, even though Whitman had published in other periodicals before, getting in the Tribune was kind of a big deal. Um, so I try to pay some attention to that, and uh, I also try to pay attention to the way in which the Tribune as a whole, uh, uh, in particular through Greeley's celebrity and also the weekly edition, uh, which went well beyond New York, helped to kind of lay the groundwork for a Northern audience's self-understanding as a distinctive group uh, with a particular relationship to national history, um, all within a sort of transatlantic framework of Eng English language news. Um, so all of that is sort of the, in a nutshell, what the book is taking up. And it all relates to uh, a larger assumption that I'm making that um, before the first Civil War monument uh, was ever erected, these large questions of national memory were arising out of antebellum uh, sectional and racialized conflicts that periodicals were having a major role in framing and shaping. And so that's sort of where the interests of the book intersect, I think, with periodical literature. And I think I'll stop it there and just uh, allow the next person to talk a little. And if things come up, we can talk about questions you have later. Great. Thank you, Sam. Um, and now, uh, sorry, just pulling up my order. Uh, James, are you ready to talk a little bit? Uh, yep. Can you hear me OK? Got it. Uh, OK. Um, yeah, I'll just echo previous thoughts. Thanks very much to um, uh, the society and then congrats again to Victoria who um, is a colleague and friend at Northumbria which is nice uh, not not just a very very talented uh, academic but also maybe the nicest person in in UK academia so uh, very very well deserved um, I'll just uh, kind of yeah quickly touch on the genesis and then um, the thing I really want to talk about in, in regards to my project is archives um, and the relationship of, of periodicals and, and periodical studies to the archive. Um, so as a summary my book is mainly about Ebony magazine. Um, if you aren't familiar is uh, was one of the most prominent black magazines of the 20th century. Um, very very popular monthly publication, quite bougie, quite consumerist, um, generally seen history in terms of the historiography as being quite light touch. Uh, Lerone Bennett Jr. Um, is again, someone who, who may not be familiar to you, can stake a legitimate claim to being the most widely read um, African-American historian of the 20th century uh, through his, his book length work, but uh, most notably through his role as the in-house historian at Ebony Magazine. Um, and my project really started, um, it was a dissertation project that I did at the University of Manchester in the UK. And um, I was quite interested in Ebony as a publication. Um, it's been a large section of its uh, back catalogue has been digitised and searchable through Google Books. It's a, it's a great digital resource. And um, it's kind of going through and there's lots of, you know, just like... Sammy Davis Jr. on holiday and uh, Muhammad Ali a uh, photo shoot at home and then in between these these uh, these articles on black celebrity um, were these often quite um, militant historical treaties from from this guy called Ryan Bennett Jr. and I was like well this what what's this stuff doing in this magazine I'm confused um, like how is he getting away with this um, and then that kind of set me on a road down thinking about um, the magazine's 
internal politics and also the, the internal politics of Johnson Publishing, the, the parent company, and the particular relationship and positionality that um, Bennett shared uh, with other editors and, and publisher, and then also that he held within the company. And he carved out this really interesting um, space for himself um, to, to kind of push a lot of the magazine's content in, in quite interesting and often quite radical ways. Um, in terms of the project specifically and in terms of archives, and that's the thing I really want to just touch on, um, I think it's, you know, we talked a lot about the, the kind of digital um, revolution in terms of periodical studies. And um, I think a lot of, of my work, particularly in to do with Bennett, um, comes back to the materiality and, and the kind of precarity of, of print culture and of, and of periodical studies. Um, the focus on Bennett uh, for this book and, and for some of my other books it was really quite um, accidental, um, at least in terms of him being a, being a central character. And it came through um, a relationship I have with the Black Metropolis Research Consortium in Chicago. Um, I've been, been lucky to have a few fellowships with them. And um, basically, Chicago State University um, happened into an, an enormous collection of, of Bennett's archival material. And this was material that was at the old Johnson Publishing Building in Chicago um, that was left in his office after he um, left the company. Um, the, it was put into storage. The upkeep on the storage um, wasn't paid within the context of the dissolution and fragmentation of Johnson Publishing as an enterprise. And um, it was all going to get thrown out. Uh, it was about 100 40 moving boxes worth of stuff, like big boxes. And um, the archivist at that time was Aisha Haeckel at Chicago State. Um, I think one of the movers basically recognized Bennett's name because he, he might have previously read Ebony or read one of Bennett's books. And, uh, and he, he called Chicago State and was like, oh, do you, do you want this stuff, basically? Um, so without that you know, intervention, all of that stuff would have been lost. And I happened to be in Chicago at the exact time that this was happening. Um, and Aisha like, kind of called me about it and I had a meltdown uh, and then I went to Chicago State and um, there were just like bin liners full of material everywhere. Um, and this was back in, um, I think it was 2013 or 2014. And then the collection was embargoed for a long period of time. Um, but I was fortunate enough to be able to have a kind of a look into a lot of the material um, and help catalog some of it in in in, in my in kind of you know a small contribution um and then recently that publication uh sorry that collection has, has started to be opened up um to the broader public um but the the point on value and like what we perceive in, in terms of the periodical studies um in relation to editorial content i mean bennett's value as a historian and his role as a popular historian and the value of ebony as a historical book um is, is not particularly valued historically um, in many ways and in many sections and communities of American society. Um, and it, it was kind of insane to me that someone who, who could, you know, who could have, you know, his, his work was read by millions and millions and millions of people over decades and decades. And then, you know, all of this material was just going to get thrown in the dump. Um, and it was just just chance that it was rescued and turned into this incredible collection. And it's, you know, and no disrespect to Chicago State, but it's, you know, it's a Chicago State, a quite very under, underfunded public um, small institution. You know, it's not um, UIC or Northwestern or University of Chicago. Um, and I think that's kind of a broader um, issue when we think about periodical culture and, and uh, not only like what we choose and value and save um, but also just a reminder of the continued precarity of a lot of the materials that we work with you know we talk a lot about the digitization and the way that that's revolutionized and um, particularly interaction with the black press and that's great um, but also at the same time you know materials are disappearing every day in front of our eyes constantly um, and that's constantly you know a process of pushing back against that loss um, so that was really at the heart of, of this project for me. And uh, yeah, that's kind of the starting point, I guess. And I'm happy to talk about that further. Thanks. Thanks, James. And so last but not least is Paul. Paul, can you talk a little bit about the genesis of your project and its relationship to periodical studies? 
No, certainly. Can you all hear me all right? Excellent. So, uh, so again, th thank you to uh, RSAP and the, the Book Prize panel for, yeah, for, for their work and, um, and, and congratulations to, to the fellow panelists. Uh, and I'll, I'll just say then a bit about Dreaming the Graphic Novel. Uh, and I guess it started about 10 years ago when I was doing some work on Art Spiegelman um, in the British Library. Uh, and I was coming across, I guess, a lot of graphic novels from the 70s uh, and the sort of material I was finding sort of made it clear that I mean I think in comic studies there were those sort of two central um, you know, points of perceived wisdom about graphic novels before the 1980s one is that they weren't many and, and the other is that the, 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 the term is popularized and it, it closely associated with a 1978 graphic novel called A Contract with God by Will Eisner and I think the sort of material I was finding just, just contradicted that. Uh, and I guess I, so I thought there was a story to tell that would, uh, that wasn't the one that was, was really deeply embedded in, in comic studies. Uh, so from that point, it, it was certainly a case of um, visiting, visiting archives and publishers, interviewing creators, um, trawling old fanzines, and, and I guess just recording more and more data about graphic novels from the 70s and how they were marketed and, and how the term circulated. Uh, and I guess somewhere in the middle of all this, uh, I decided that the best way to, uh, to kind of make a case or to, to gather, to organize this data would, would be through kind of the construction of, um, yeah, of kind of a big data set and statistics, statistical analysis. So I sort of dug out, dug out my old maths A level notes and, and tried to remember how to do confidence intervals. Uh, and and uh, I think what, whatever I do next, uh, I, I'm I'm confident it won't involve any more Excel, not not for a little while anyway. Uh, in terms of the relationship of the book to to periodical studies, I mean I think the text that I examine actually. Kind of want to deny their existence, uh, their kind of oranges in or existence as periodicals. I mean, the this period of time I'm looking at sees an awful lot of stakeholders in in American comics, sort of, of often talking about the death of comics. That um, yeah, the the comics had to find a uh, a way forward and uh, and and in some ways choose between whether the fate of American comics lay with periodicals or, or with books. And, and all sorts of kind of associations were bound up with that, that, that periodicals were associated with, with child consumers, with kind of knockabout popular culture, and books with supposedly older, more middle-class educated readers. And, and with that came uh, all sorts of gendered and sexed assumptions about uh, which which of these paths comics should follow. And um, I, I guess what, one of the things noticeable uh, as I was sort of retracing these stories from the 70s was how uh, there was a, there were certain similarities, I guess, with the last decade of politics um, on both sides of the Atlantic in the way in which accusations of things like elitism and being out of touch with the people become ways of, of silencing uh, certain voices. Uh, and I, another way I think in which the books sort of interfaces with periodical studies is uh, the, the idea that it's it's a kind of analysis of what happens to a mass publishing industry when when things go downhill very quickly. So so I mean, by no means were sales of comic books at their lowest in the seventies; they'd get lower. Uh, but but I, I think late sixties, seventies, there was a this real wide and deep seated sense that uh, the American comic book had stepped off a cliff edge and it couldn't, um, so some sort of radical changes were needed, new ideas. And although I think the graphic novel uh, was you know, now in the 2020s, it seems like a, uh, yeah, a solution was found. I mean, many more you know, uh, graphic novel sales exceed uh, periodical comic sales uh, and then they have done for a couple of decades. Uh, even though that's the case now, I mean, one of the things that made the book fun actually was these, I don't know, the, the grand dreams that people had back in, back in the sort of 60s and 70s, this idea that what, you know, if, if comics weren't, were going to sort of be radically reimagined, what, what might that look like? How could you sell comics differently? How could you package comics differently? Uh, I mean, one of the, the, the the things that I always remember is, is the comic mobile 
so so the publisher DC came up with this idea in the early 70s that the way to get to sell comics was to to kind of basically take a van and um, take it to things like beaches or parks and and that would be how you could sell comics and it would drive around neighborhoods with you know with a bell ringing and uh, you know people would run out and stop the van to buy comics so you know, the, the comic mobile was one of the I don't know, the fun discoveries of the project. Uh, as I say, I think the, it's that, uh, that sense of um, these, big, uh, these big ideas about what comics would look like, but both really kind of quite apocalyptic visions about American comics in the 70s, but also incredibly, you know, say grand hopes that perhaps were, that never came to be realized were also being articulated. So, so yeah, the, um, I think that, that, I, that sense of, what happens to a, a periodical industry when, when things seem to be going so badly wrong? Uh, I think that's kind of one of, the, one of the things that the book the book touches on. Great, thank you. Thank you uh, uh, to all of our authors um, for talking a little bit about the genesis of your projects and the, these different sorts of relationships to periodical studies. I mean, I think one of the thing that, things that's that's so interesting to me and that was so interesting in, in reading through these books is all the different ways people come at periodical study, sometimes perhaps not intentionally or not you know, knowing that they're even coming at periodical studies um, and all the different kinds of work that emerges out of it. But at the same time, the intersections between um, these books, you know, the ways in which questions of editing um, became very central uh, to to pretty much all of them. Um, the real um, importance of, that that Paul was just talking about and that Jane was talking about of, of comics. You know, the, the sort of re the relationship between comics and periodical studies has become, I think, really crucial um, in periodical studies uh, as as um, as a field of a subfield of study. So, uh, you know, I think that these books really speak to one another. Um, I'd really love for us to have a discussion. So if, um, if the panelists have questions for each other, or if uh, there are questions from the audience, we have about half an hour, um, half an hour, 35 minutes. Uh, so we have time for a pretty robust discussion. Um, please feel free to put questions in the chat or um, raise your hand virtually or just raise your hand and we'll do our best. Um, I cannot see everyone on one screen, but do our best to get to you as quickly as possible. And if any of the co-hosts see someone and, and I don't, please just jump in. But um, with that, I'd just like to open it up um, to either the panelists, uh, if you have questions for one another uh, or to uh, the, the audience more generally. Sorry, I just muted myself instead of unmuting myself. Uh, Pat Collier, you have your hand up. Hi, uh, congratulations to everybody and thanks for that really great round table. Um, I was just, I mean, um, Paul's uh, comments just really got me thinking about media transformation um, and you know the degree to which transformations that are sort of much larger than any individual periodical and sometimes even larger than like a whole class of periodicals can both kind of like drive innovation but also sort of like you know end some careers and end some titles and things like that and I just thought that might be a good question to sort of cut across some of these books um, and so I thought I'd just throw that out to the panel about like how you see media ecology transformation sort of, uh, you know, in the process of your books? Um, well, I'll just start by saying that one thing that I've seen come up over and over in various projects that maybe there's a book out about it, and if there is, please someone say so, but um, is syndication, um, especially at the end of the 19th century. Um, you know, what I see over and over again is that that, you know, it's not really a kind of periodical, but completely transformed the way that periodicals operated to change the whole conception of authorship, change what editing looked like. Um, and in some ways, I think it's such a huge topic that it's really difficult to put your finger on it. Um, that also um, actually goes back to the previous panel too about metadata. You know, like what is the metadata for syndication? Um, I don't even know how to 
I can't even wrap my head around it. Um, so that was the thing that immediately leaped to mind for me. Is there a book on syndication? Is it, could it fit in a book? I guess that's a question. <laughs> I mean, it, just to sort of continue uh, that idea of, of, of media ecology. Um, I mean, I, I think the, the period, so the period I was, I was looking at, one of the the massive changes that just ripples out everywhere is kind of the just the conglomeration of media uh, uh, and the way in which you know, we, we do have these multinational, uh, yeah, multinational corporations that are you know, bringing together. Um, yeah, book publishing, Hollywood cinema, television, uh, and that's. I mean, I think we're still we're still living through the repercussions of that. Uh, but but that's. But but certainly, uh, you know, again, the comic industry is part of that. You know, when you get DC, and Marvel being bought bought up by by much bigger conglomerates. So, so I think the um yeah the uh, absolutely it's uh, you you couldn't. You couldn't start to do research into, I think, uh, yeah, certainly the comic book industry, but I think lots of forms of periodical publishing are being just uh, yeah, completely rewired by that conglomeration that, uh, yeah, is taking place in the media more generally. Just to build, I don't know, can people hear me okay? I'm not sure if there's something wrong with my mic. Can you hear okay? I, I was just going to build on uh, what Paul uh, was saying there too, just also his metaphor for sort of dreaming, I think is important and it strikes a chord with a lot of what was going on in the 19th century. I think in part because we, in retrospect, we often think about these developments as almost inevitable or deterministic, that there's a certain kind of consolidation that just happens because of an industry shifts in a discernible way. And I think for the people who are involved in it at the time, it's much more an open question about how things are gonna pan out. So you see something like the New York Tribune, there had never been anything like the Weekly Tribune until there was the Weekly Tribune. But even the people who were doing the Tribune didn't know exactly what was happening, right? And so there was a way in which I think that creates a kind of culture for a lot of folks in that era where there's just kind of a way of you're dreaming about what these forms are gonna be, right? You're sort of trying to figure it out. And I think that allows for you know, uh, cross genre stuff, uh, ways in which people who might be interested in the newspapers as a venue for publishing something like poetry as Whitman was, might also be thinking about how those media shifts could affect the kind of poetry that you could write, the kind of audience that you could re reach out for. And in retrospect, a lot of that sort of falls away in the same way that some of that archival stuff gets left out. Like it just doesn't fit the paradigm that ends up becoming the dominant paradigm for thinking about how culture worked <laughs> you know, at that time. But when you look back at it, when you see the sort of nitty gritty, it's almost always a more interesting and variegated sort of situation in part because nobody knows how it's gonna turn out. So I like this idea uh, that Paul's sort of focusing on of the dream in part because it recovers that sort of textured weirdness uh, that I think is in, often there when there's gonna be a big shift, <laughs> right? Uh, but I don't know how many of you have run into the same thing, especially people probably who work in archives and end up looking at things that have been gathering dust for so long, right? That's sometimes where you see all of that weirdness showing up. Victoria, you have your hand up. And then Tara. Yeah, I'm just um, taking, vigorously taking notes here because it, it's, it's a, uh, really helpful to, to hear, always, always helpful to hear the periodical perspective. So I'm thinking about the media ecologies and I'm thinking about at the beginning of the 1920s and the rise of um, PR and the ways in which the editors of the Dial in particular were really good at getting news out about the Dial in high circulation um, periodicals such as the New York Times. So you get this situation where actually not many people are reading the dial at all, um, but they know about the dial and they know about its reputation for being um, a site of highbrow culture. And that's enough. Once you put that idea in circulation and it starts to be pick, picked up by other newspapers and magazines, that's enough. You don't need to read modernist text to know what modernism is supposed to be. Which I, which I think is a kind of really interesting way of thinking about how modernism becomes institutionalized. Um, but there was something else I was thinking of as well. Oh, that's right. And I think basically 
that the dial couldn't survive because of the ways in which by the mid 1920s, modernist texts were starting to be reproduced um, in a variety of different ways in lots and lots of um, kind of uh, mass circulation magazines. So you didn't have to pay 50 cents to buy the dial to get hold of some of these publications anymore. And so I think, you know, in a sense, the magazine market shifted quite drastically in the middle of the 1920s. And the dial was in a sense kind of old fashioned and left behind as a result of that. Tara, you had your hand up? Yes, thank you. Um, really appreciated hearing about all of your books and the time that you gave to talking about the genesis of the book, as well as some of your thoughts about how it relates to periodical studies. And that makes me think that this panel is, is a particularly appropriate place um, to comment on something that I see as sort of an extra um, kudo to people who complete books in periodical studies that perhaps nobody else is really quite aware of so much as other people who've written books in periodical studies or even started or tried to write them. Um, and that is that um, there are some kinds of projects that organize themselves. So if you're writing a biography, you're usually going chronologically. Um, if you are writing one of the many books in American studies that were sort of the monuments of American critical studies in the 1950s or 60s, or 70s or 80s, many of them focus on novels. And so boom, 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 there's a chapter for each novel. And you can see people's dissertation books had three chapters for three novels or five chapters for five novels or five authors and a story for each author. You know, there are lots of landmark books that have that kind of academic organization. And one of the things that I've observed in working with periodicals um, since my own dissertation um, a long time ago now um, was that, uh, in this field particularly, you have to exercise a special kind of creative ingenuity just to figure out how to organize your project. Um, and, and I think that's, I don't know if that's appreciated by, um, by, by book publishers um, and presses so much, but uh, a successful periodical book that has coherence, a through narrative and logic from beginning to end requires a kind of ingenuity from the author uh, that I, I think not every book requires um, and, and therefore not every reader appreciates. But in this panel particularly, I think we're in a space where probably many more readers and audience members like me um, can perhaps appreciate that you didn't just complete a book, but you completed a book with Henry Jamesian prowess um, in designing a form, designing creatively a form that fit your subject. Um, and I haven't even read these books yet, and I'm excited to do so, and I'm excited to hear about them and your methods. Um, but I think two things, Victoria mentioned the, the narrowing down, oh no, Jean mentioned the narrowing down of the project, and Victoria sort of mentioned the expanding of the project, right? It was supposed to be about one author, but then it had to be significant. If a, if a press is going to take our periodical books, they have to have sort of wider appeal and significance, right? So we have to both expand our narrow little archival project, but we also have to narrow, as Jean said, our massive American studies, um, earth shattering ideas into something we can really study. Um, and so, um, so that, that periodical people in order to complete a book have to have first navigated that, um, that delicate balancing act between the large and the small, um, between Victoria's new title and subtitle and Jean's original project and eventual project uh, and and then also figure out a creative way to organize which is more than just you know scholarly skill that's writerly skill so I really want to celebrate everybody here for doing unique things that maybe only the fellow prestidigitators in this room uh, with these unique uh, sets of nerdy interest to go back to Sharita's <laughs> wonderful self-characterization uh, earlier. Um, but this set of people I think can appreciate that. And I certainly appreciate that as, as a former editor and a writer and someone who's been working a long time with periodicals. It's easier to write articles about periodicals um, and really amazing and like writing a novel, um, I think, to write a good critical book about periodicals. So bigger kudos to everyone here, not just for finishing a book, but for finishing a periodical book um, that you made both large and small, I trust, because I trust that the, all the, the readers of the prizes 
already made these judgments. So I trust that this is all true before I read your books, but that the large and small are balanced in some beautiful way and that your creative organization um, turned a mess of archive uh, into a coherent and beautiful and readable engaging story, adjective after adjective. I, I celebrate all of you as much as that. So thank you for the work that you've done that was massively invisible, no doubt for a long time. Um, and I think this is a place where people can really appreciate the nuances of what you had to pull off. Huge applause. I think that's not a question, <laughs> but if any panelist wants to uh, follow up on any of those struggles, please feel free, but congratulations. That's the nicest non-question I've ever heard at a, at a conference. So usually it's a real problem when they're a comment, but that's wonderful. Do any panelists want to respond in any way to such <laughs> wonderful, generous comments? Yeah, Victoria, you have your hand up. Well, just to say thank you, Tara, you know, for saying that it was, it took a long, long time to write that book. It, you know, it really did. And, and my head of department kept saying, where's the book? Where's the book? Where's, what are you doing? You're so slow. What's going on? You know, um, and you just have to stick with it. it. But it's absolutely right what Tara's saying. It's the organisation. And actually, to be quite honest, at least, you know, I had four years of one magazine and I had one editor. And in a sense, even though I, I left behind Marianne Moore as kind of, you know, author, if you see what I mean, or poet, at the same time, having more there was a sort of way of creating some kind of coherence, um, you know, for the narrative. So that did help enormously. And I, I, I have incredible admiration for, you know, scholars who pull together work on periodicals uh, across many, many years um, and many, many issues. It, as, as, um, as we're all saying, it's incredibly difficult to do well. Jean? Um, yeah, I just wanted to comment on the, um, the way that this work is valued. Um, you know, I mentioned this chair, uh, department chair, who kind of intervened um, in sort of cruel, but, if, you know, kind ways at the same time. But you know, one of the really important things he did for me, both as a chair and as a colleague, is that he actually wrote a letter on my behalf for you know, some kind of review um, where he really emphasized the um, difficulties of archival research. And he is not an archivist. You know, he doesn't do this kind of research. He's a kind of a author text, do close reading kind of person. Um, but because of that, he was able to really recognize how time consuming this kind of research is, how resource intensive it is and how difficult it is to, to actually get the resources to go to archives um, or you know, gain access to the kinds of things we need. And, um, and I didn't realize at the time when he wrote me that letter, how important that was. Um, and I would just encourage people because we're all, we all recognize the value of this, all of us in this room. And, and I think it's really important for us to foreground that when we're doing this work for our colleagues, especially our junior colleagues um, in this time of precarity. Um, because I think we kind of take for granted that this is valuable, but I think a lot of times we have to articulate and make it visible for other people. Um, so yeah, that was just the thing that came to mind to me. And I also, Tara, that is like the nicest, most beautiful comment I've ever <laughs> heard at a conference. So, <laughs> so thank you for that. Let me put in a plug real quick to, you know, put my RSAT president hat on for one second to just say that, um, you know, this is the place to send people who are interested in periodicals and, and our journal, you know, American periodicals and our article prize, which is specifically for junior scholars. Um, and that's a way to have that kind of work valued. You know, like I, as a graduate student, had a piece published in, in American periodicals. Um, and that uh, sort of showed me that this field exists and this kind of work is valued. Um, so please do, uh, you know, all of you who, who are, if you're junior, send us your work. If you're senior, send us your work, but also tell your, your, your students, your junior colleagues. Um, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, Jean was instrumental in, in making Amer American periodicals a site of mentorship. So please do, um, Please do 
send people to us because this is a place where we're nice about these things. Um, Mons, I know you had a question and then um, Kirsten and then Sam. So I totally agree with you all and what Tara was saying. I really enjoy uh, uh, what she was mentioning about how the narrative arc is so important for editors. And sometimes we have just a scattered and displays a narrative, especially when we recover periodicals that are from communities that their memories have not been um, taken care of, like the periodicals I found were in basements full of humidity. So obviously the, there are gaps and we know, we in fear that that person has done a lot, especially if they were workers, but you, we, just want, we just want to, or we can only do as much as we have. So uh, we can represent that person, not in all that they did because we don't have it, but the little notice we have from a periodical that we realize it was much more than that. But I've noticed that that's why I started my digital project, that editors are not interested in that, right? They still want the figure, right? The person who ran it all. And most of these periodicals were communal, you know, enterprises that one year, one person ran it and then the other ran it and then the other. So how do you deal with that when talking with editors about how important it is also to recover grassroots communal experiences where everybody chips in and not necessarily just a person. I try to do that in my book, like talking about the organization and then about the periodical. And reviewers would say, either talk about the organiza organization or either talk about the periodical, but you cannot talk about both. And I say, well, they are the authors. How can I not talk about them? So yeah, so how do you deal with that when you're researching on periodicals? Any panelists want to jump in and address that? Um, well, I'll just I'll just say I, I was very fortunate in finding the complete run of the dial when I when I was sort of looking for it that one of the American libraries was selling it and I, I bought it for something like 200 pounds well my department bought it for me and it's just sitting on my shelves and I've been so lucky it is starting to crumble but I can really appreciate the difficulties of some of these archives and we can already see from James's contribution that you know that they are they are some of them disappearing they're difficult to access we know we've got lots of archives that are digitized but at the same time we've got lots, lots of archives that aren't um, and we've got this sense of a kind of uh, now, and there's a there's a critic who works on this equal that the digital penumbra, you know, the, the sense in which there's an awful lot of material out there that's just never going to be, never going to be discussed, never going to become visible, you know, for the reasons um, that we're talking about. I was sort of struck by the, I think, two problems that Mansa's point was raising is one, the archival problem of actually recovering stuff that hasn't been taken care of, but then the difficulty uh, I think that Tara was pointing to before about how you craft a narrative, which is I think what the what the editors are thinking about when they're coming back and saying, don't tell me so much about the organization. And it strikes me that in, in an odd way, that's also something that happens when we're dealing with particular figures that we work with, um, which is both a problem for us as authors, how do we craft a narrative, but also in a weird way, I think part of the historical record, because history itself is driven by narratives. And so I was struck by, and this is a way to sneak in the question I was going to ask really for the panelists, but then anybody really who wanted to respond to it, of what Victoria was talking about as a kind of complicated form of editorial agency, where it's really easy, if you're a sexist or even if you're not, to point to an editor like Moore and say, you're responsible, <laughs> right? You're the reason that it turned out this way, in part because it fits a narrative. Once you get into the weeds of what that kind of complicated agency that Victoria is talking about actually involves, thinking about audiences and publishers and all these weird vectors that are very hard to sort out, it becomes a complicated story. And I think then it becomes a problem for the other kind of editor that Mons is talking about, right? How do you tell a compelling story about something that's really complicated? Uh, and, and it strikes me that this question of editorial agency is a sort of sub-question or sub sub field of that 
problem that we might run into, and probably a lot of us have, um, because it's really easy just to say Greeley, right? <laughs> and then make it about him as if he wasn't always thinking about his audience and publishers and how much he was gonna make and what his political options might be. And it, like, it's not just about his opinions or the way he shaped a public. Even though that's the easiest way to fit him into a story, that's not really what's happening. And it struck me that maybe James was having some of those issues too in his, in his work and thinking about a certain kind of popular history uh, and what were the boundaries around that. Um, so I just wondered if anybody else had run into similar kinds of issues to the ones I think Victoria has mentioned and maybe Mons too, the two kinds of editors uh, there. James, did you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think it's a it's a really perceptive point. And um, I think in terms of Ebony and in terms of Bennett, I mean, Bennett's core audience and his imagined audience and his desired audience was black people. So um, it's kind of interesting to see the public response and um, to a lot of his work, particularly his more controversial work. So in the late 60s, he wrote this really controversial article for Ebony called Was Abraham Lincoln a White Supremacist? Um, and this was kind of demolished in the New York Times and created uproar. But then there was, you've got dozens and dozens of letters to, to Bennett from, from black readers who were like, this is exactly what I've been thinking, but haven't been able to vocalize like <laughs> basically my entire life. Um, so that kind of intentionality and, and in terms of audience um, and trying to pass that out, I think is really important. Um, I think for, for Bennett as well, one really interesting thing that I found in terms of intentionality was um, how his work took on legs in ways that he doesn't didn't necessarily want it to. So um, Ebony it was had an incredible. It was it was one of the first black publications to generate mainstream advertising, and um, in in large part due to the popularity of Bennett's work, um, corporate advertisers by the mid '60s had started to jump on what the Chicago Defender described as the Negro history bandwagon. So increasingly in Ebony and in other black publications, um, Bennett's historical treaties were being published alongside adverts, which projected their own images of black history in ways that overlapped um, and sometimes rubbed quite awkwardly against Bennett's own writing. Um, and certainly by the 1980s, the advertising black history content in Ebony had become the dominant force um, in the magazine's historical coverage. So that's, you know, a kind of long afterlife of Bennett's work that gets quite far away from his original intentions when he started writing in the late 50s and early 60s, which was a, which was a process of kind of uh, recovery and quite a radical process. And by the by the mid 80s, Ebony's representation of black history is, is coming through um, predominantly um, adverts celebrating the uh, commemoration of Martin Luther King Day by Delta or by McDonald's. Um, and it's a, it's a quite, you know, a corporate engagement and co-optation of, of that initial uh, message in a way that's quite interesting. Kirsten? Yeah, I was just gonna say that um... I'm obsessed with methodology when I look at, at work on periodical studies, um, you know, and I think it speaks to this point about, you know, the, the struggle of constructing a coherent narrative about around periodicals, um, you know, that method methodology is crucial, you know, in ways I think this is not so obvious necessarily. I mean, getting the methodology right um, is important because, uh, you know, it, you know, you could say, well, you can't make that kind of claim about this magazine that way. You know, I mean, it's really important to get that right. And it's, I've been thinking a, a lot more about it because I'm teaching, um, I'm teaching a whole uh, class on 1920s magazines. And so I'm always assigning students, you know, an essay or a chapter with the magazine we're looking at that demonstrates a different kind of approach. So I'm always teaching them a methodology and trying to um, trying to make them unlearn crap that they learn in <laughs> literary studies about close reading and or you know there's different kinds of close reading you do that you know um and, and distant reading indeed <laughs> and um um so i mean for me it's just um i love hearing stories about like genes about you know 
how how the book came to be that messiness of of how, how, how books came to be because when you read them they just look so beautifully coherent you can't you can't see that kind of mess behind it um and i just i think you know part of that work of of what we do as periodical scholars is, is, is that the hard work is finding the methodology i mean i wrote a book and then completely rewrote a book <laughs> that you know took 10 years because I didn't have the methodology right and even though it had been accepted by the publisher and even though it got past the readers when it came back to me I just I had I completely rewrote the bloody thing because the methodology was wrong to, to me you know anyway <laughs> so um yeah it's kind of picking up on Tara is that you know anyone who can write a periodicals book and gets the methodology right from the beginning before they've written the whole thing is, is, is lucky <laughs> <laughs> Do any of the panelists want to uh, talk about methodology anymore? <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm not muted. <laughs> uh, I was, let's call it methodology. <laughs> yeah, I was laughing because I thought, oh my God, please do not look in my closet. You know, I don't even know if I could, if I could define my methodology now. And that was actually a, a concern that came up with readers was... I'm not sure about the methodology here, but now that I've gotten the honorable mention, I can just say that, right? <laughs> but there is a kind of, um, you know, I'm just thinking about what Victoria was saying about how the encounter with the archive actually causes you to shift, I mean, your methodology. I mean, that's what happens with this kind of research, right? And um, yeah, I just, and so it was really hard then to kind of like fit it into a box once I was like, well, here's my research and this is the story I wanna tell. And there does seem to be a little bit of like, okay, so what's the methodology that I can kind of like use to tell that story, um, which feels a little like you don't want to tell anybody that, right? Um, so that, that's, my, that's my confession. No method to your madness. I got to jump in though and say the method discussion is always so useful. I remember years ago um, at an ALA panel from RSAP, I think Ben, you were talking along with some others about your methodology for something. Ooh, I hope it was you and I'm not just like making this up, but it was so, I was like, oh my gosh, I never thought about doing this or trying it that way. And, you know, especially for those of us who have been sort of, um, trailing behind in all the digital methods and digital uses, um, you know, I constantly feel like I'm playing catch up here with all the new stuffs coming out. Hearing about people's methods, um, your ways of organizing your information and of putting together your studies, especially given, you know, how access has changed. I, I think we need to have more of that. Um, so I would certainly propose, you know, send those sorts of things to American periodicals. Look at that shameless little plug there. Because um, we would definitely welcome that sort of conversation uh, in, the, in the journal. And maybe at our, our little proposed Zoom coffee chats. So we have about five minutes left um, before we go to our break. Sarah, you had your hand up for a while. Thanks. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll try to compress this into like two minutes, which is, I mean, I'm just love to hear all y'all talk about your methods and, and thinking about periodicals. And I think I would, I would feel remiss if I didn't sort of say that I think to me, the question of editorships and the question of methods for us are like, they just are overlapping and intertwined, right? Because I think one of the things that's hard, can be hard about telling the stories of periodicals in the way that you were sort of talking about Tara is um, how to account for what you're seeing and how to describe what you're seeing when some of the languages that we have for doing that are as, as folks were saying in the chat earlier, sort of author centric or individually organized or organized around ideas about purpose that don't quite account for the kinds of legs or circulations that we all like the which is the water that we all sort of swim in when we work with periodicals right um so just to me it's really 
really compelling to be in a space where folks are sort of having a method conversation and a conversation about the types of editorship and the kinds of periodical creativities and that those are happening in the same time and place. Um, and so I just wanted, I wanted to thank all y'all for making that conversation available. This too is not a question, but a comment. <laughs> thank you, Ben. <laughs> Well, let me um, wrap us up with a, a sort of final comment of taking the chair's prerogative. And that is that one of the things that struck me about um, so many of the books that we read uh, and especially those that, you know, the most successful, the, the prize winner and the honorable mentions, um, and this gets to questions of organization and method is the focus on people. You know that um, it's it, this is print culture. This is periodical studies. But how how rich a story we get when we start to talk about the actual people that make these periodicals, and don't think of them as these uh, kind of sterile um, print objects. And one of the things I think that print that periodical studies, at least at the right now, is doing so well is recovering these people and trying to tell the stories of these people and how these people, the messiness that Sam talked about. That, that emerges when you actually look at what the people who were working on the periodicals thought, you know, like what they said, what they were doing. Um, yeah, as, as Pat Collier says uh, in the chat, making all this downstream labor um, <laughs> visible, uh, you know, that, that, that's something that I think these books have, have just do spectacularly well. Um, and, and that's so exciting uh, to see that, that connect um, the, the periodical with the people behind it. And I, I think is also something of an ethical imperative, at least in the, in the work that I do and, and the work that I really admire. So I just wanna again say congratulations to everyone. Um, please go buy their books, uh, the, you know, read them, teach them. I think that's incredibly important. Um, you know, teach more than one chapter so your students have to buy them. Uh, I think that's incredibly important. Um, you know, like if we don't read and, and teach and spread the word about our books, like I don't know who's going to. So um, that's something I think I was taught in RSAP. Uh, so please, um, I'm looking forward to teaching many of these books um, in the coming years. And, and I, I think they're all just foundational. So thank you so much. Congratulations to everyone. Um, it's now